How long have you lived here now? I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else, except for my parents' house when I was a kid. But since 94, so I've been here 15 years. 15? Yeah. And enjoyed every minute? Well, 16. Well, it's been pretty good, yeah, I can't complain. It's a nice, comfortable place. And, um... Uh, I don't feel any need to move, really. Got good neighbours and... Ten minutes from the sea, ten minutes from the town. The yeah. best of the weather. Yeah, best of the weather. Yeah. I should, um, we'll go for a big walk in a minute over the cliffs. Bloody great. <laughs> yeah. Look at all the apples there'll be this year on that tree. into the town or shall we go through the woods and um, and uh, across the field to the pier and along the front? Whatever's a nicer route, what do you think? Yeah, that is, that's nicer. Okay, we'll do that. Okay. There's a track of some kind, but when I was a little kid, the A1 was like this. What, just like a little... Uh... A little lane like this, about this width. Yeah, no joke, you know? And you might get a little, a little one of those little cars every 10 minutes one might chug along, you know? Incredible. You can't, it doesn't seem possible in one lifetime for that to happen, does it? To go from what it was then to what it is now. No. Bloody incredible. All the hoof uh, dents, all the uh, impressions from hooves, and <coughs> well, I suppose um, when I was uh, growing up, uh, I realised that it wasn't really a good idea allowing yourself to be controlled by other people and uh, and other events so that you had a certain amount of autonomy and the only way you can really achieve autonomy is to free yourself from other people's control and from responsibilities and I suppose I grew up with that kind of philosophy um, but of course one has to begin by earning a living and all that sort of thing and getting established in the you know getting a base and all that kind of thing and all the practical details of living. And did your, did your brother grow up with that same philosophy, do you think? No, I don't think he did, no. He was he's three years older than me and uh, and um, he was um, he, I don't think he was affected by people telling him what to do or wanting him to do this or that or being in charge of him. He never had any problems at school, everything went easy for him. When I was at school I was always getting into trouble and always being sort of kept down or you know punished or something or other you know um, no they didn't really though my dad I think you know especially when they when, when he was older he thought I was on onto a good thing he thought yeah you know he's yeah he's he's doing a sensible thing to opt out I think you know but then when they were younger things were a bit different uh, I think things got more cutthroat as they got older, as as they do. You know, uh, I mean, they had they have in my life. You know, nowadays things are much more cutthroat than they were in the 50s or 60s. Although in those days people were really backward and uh, I don't know, and and serious about the most trivial things, which um, today people laugh about. It's like you'd never think it wasn't August, would you? You'd think this was August, wouldn't you, or something now? And actually it's April. Bloody April. <laughs> You're gonna run out of film. You know, I tried to get that to grow in my garden. I've taken the seeds there. I must dig one up. Well, why? What's wrong with it? You think it would grow ever so easily? You'd think so, wouldn't you? Because it grows everywhere else. 
you seen that giant snail next to that pond? I saw that snail. Yeah, I thought you had seen it. So what's the situation, Phil? What's the situation? <laughs> Crazy. Well, it looks as if it ought to have a waterfall down there, doesn't it? Is that a big fat frog at the top there? You've got a garden you like. Yeah, I have, yeah. This is the size I'd like to have. It's beautiful. That size is just nice. If I don't look out, they're going to bloody short because I think they're bare wires, you know. They're on insulators, see that? Do you think that already sparks in the, in the weather? Well, 250 volts, it's OK, really. You're not going to get any, you know, it's, not, it's only a very low voltage really, although it's deadly, it's not enough to be a problem. But there's all those bits of wood growing around it, isn't there? Those little bits of dead ivy. And if they got wet, they could short it out a bit, couldn't they? Okay, they could carry some current away, couldn't they? So the people that run this place, they've got the upstairs, I suppose, and they've got the downstairs, and the middle bit is the pub. It's the restaurant, so it's a good idea, isn't it? Who would live here? Don't know. Somebody with loads of money. Someone coming there. There's a car coming. They're going to catch you filming. Bugger them. Bloody uh, hell. How many years have you seen this bluebell wood? I don't know. It must be about five years ago when Dorothy told me about it. She didn't think it was pretty. She thought it was excellent. <laughs> Pissy. <laughs> fat belly. <laughs> fat belly Jones. You haven't got a fat belly. Fat belly Jones, I have. Compared to what I did have a few weeks ago, it's grown quite a lot, I think. Is that Spanish influence? Yeah, Spanish wine. Spanish um, vino. Because, <laughs> I mean, you imagine being at home as a kid with your parents and everything and all the busy everyday things going on it just seems as if it's going to be like that forever doesn't it I mean they're a bit stuck really because they, they wouldn't want to change those windows and yet you'd want to change them wouldn't you if you lived there you'd want to put modern double glazed ones in but, but it would kind of spoil it if you did. So it's difficult, really. I think one of the things that attracted me about Hassa was the uh, the fact that he was kind of a rebel. He was against any kind of uh, system of authority, uh, especially when it was arbitrary and in the interests of great power. And. Uh, he was very much against borders between countries and and barriers and walls and uh, and you know people ordering each other around all the time and 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 so I think that made his work very attractive to me because that's really what he advocated above all and the um, uh, the importance of self-will autonomy. You know, why, why, why should one person's authority be more important than another's? You know, if it's based on expertise, then that's one thing, that's, that's fine. But normally it isn't. It's just based on somebody elbowing their way into a position of power. And, uh, and I think Hesse recognised that in, a, in, a, in pretty well all of his work, really. At the time, I could identify with him and his characters but then when it boiled down to it, it was really that he was following his own path. And that's really what he was saying. You know, the same as a lot of these religious leaders were actually saying, and is always misinterpreted, follow your own path, follow your own nose. Don't, you know, don't follow someone else's. And people misinterpret that as uh, being to follow their path. Uh, you know, like, like these famous religious people like Buddha and Muhammad and Jesus and all those people, people misinterpret them. What they mean is follow your own inner, what, what, what you find is your own inner meaning and not somebody else's. Um, 
And I think that's what Hesse was spelling out in a much clearer way than, than anyone before him, really. But that's a good shot with the sea and, and those inlets and everything, the nudist beach. Just make sure you don't get all that scum and pollution in. <laughs> Uh, to realise that the best thing they can do is to take nothing seriously except to prolong their life and just uh, have an easy time of it. <laughs> That's what I would say really. Just make the most of it and don't work. But these people are in Australia, they own several houses, they've built up their assets and they own several houses and yet this bloke still goes to work on this oil rig. And, and, I'm gonna, and, it, and he has incessant dreams that he's in prison. He dreams that he's in prison. And it's fucking obvious why he dreams that. I ought to email him and tell them. Because it's just, it's just so obvious that it, I, you know, I can't imagine why they don't realise it. That programme was on about a week or two ago about clouds again. I'll never forget the cloud formations that I used to see when I went to Cambridge, though, to, to visit my mum. You know, the, the cloud formations I used to see were fantastic. You see Snow White walk through the woods in a, in a big, long, flowery dress. One thing that they should, should do is get into the psychological mind frame of managing their own time without having it managed by somebody else or having to do things or make things. Um, I think um, they could end up signing on the dole or if they were lucky with um, buying a house and working for a few years and so on like I did for 10 or 12 years and then living on the, you know, sort of because of the way property prices changed and inflation and all that kind of thing, I managed to have a house, end up with a house without a mortgage. So I had somewhere to live without a big expense. But the most important thing is the mind frame, because plenty of people with loads of money get, uh, you know, have a very comfortable lifestyle, but they're stuck needing to work. So and how do you get the mind frame? Um, by spending as much time as you can not working, I think, for a start. I think the job I had, working a seven day fortnight, ten hour days, was a good uh, kind of introduction to retirement, really. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to see life as, a, as, as something to enjoy, something to retire. Retiring, I mean, work is a menace. Middle class people with plenty of money in the past, the sensible ones have never worked in their lives. They just do nice things like travelling around or playing um, golf all day or doing all kinds of things that are a pleasure, creative things. They do sculpturing or painting and uh, travelling. They do all kinds of things, writing. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, put, that, you know, that I would advise people to try and do. Uh, if technology improves enough in the next hundred years or so, eventually everyone will be able to do that and everything will be manufactured and all the work done by machines. That's, that's the ideal, the utopian, utopian situation. Blimey, there's a load of lunars over there. There's a couple here as well. Yeah. I've been to Wookie Hole, I went, remember going down into a cave. And it was really um, kind of duff. Yeah, most years we'd come here, not every year, but most years, because my grandmother lived in Sussex, so we used to, it was a cheap holiday for my parents. They didn't have to pay for accommodation, because they, we just stayed with my grandmother. And we'd come on days out, sometimes to Hastings, sometimes to Rye or Bexhill or Tunbridge Wells, anywhere, you know. So it was a good, uh, good holiday. So, yeah, I've known Hastings all my life, really. And this is where that picture was taken, yeah. with that rock. Yeah. That's the rock in the background on the picture. Yeah, and you'll, you'll be able to match it up, actually. If you, um, yeah. Look at the picture on the side. Yeah. Flying fart machine.
Uh, I don't mean good or bad, there's people who will just go for money, come what may, and other people will go for fairness, come what may. You know, there's two kinds of people. I really think there's two kinds of people. Like there's Tories and, and socialists. Do you know what I mean? I mean, people say to me, or, or they might be justified saying to me, I'm a hypocrite to have shares and also, well, I haven't got many. Uh, and, uh, and then argue how bad the system is, you know. Um, and they're right, yeah, well, but people are hypocrites, aren't they? It's definitely massively bigger than the one I saw on the seafront. I think, really? it, I think it was Flying Doctor, not Air Ambulance. It didn't have room for a stretcher in it or anything like this one's got. What do you think of the situation now? I think it's excellent. No complaints at all. Um, absolutely perfect. A bloody good guy. Another good guy. What? In the life of Ivan. <laughs> and you're now going to devour this? Yep. Yeah. You're going to devour the chicken food. Yeah. Have a chip. Have a chip, please. We're not, we're not, we don't have it in heaven, though, you know. I think... I think um, our parents and mentors and people like that drum it into us, yeah. But I don't think we're set up for it at all. You know, I think that's so all artificial. And uh, there's plenty of people in the world get on fine without all that mumbo jumbo. And they're better off without it, really. It's just a menace. When people believe things that are humbug, then they're, you know, heading for trouble, I think, really. Why would the establishment do anything? except to give itself a more solid foundation and, and a, a more reliable, you know, world to control. You know, that has more, you know, it doesn't have to worry about being overthrown. But I'd much rather not have that extra kind of freedom and the hassle of getting the money. Do you know what I mean? The hassle of getting the money is going to make it so you'll never be able to enjoy the freedom. And, and I think everybody suffers that but to very tiny amounts and all, you know, do you know what I mean? I think it's a scale. I think everybody suffers from post-traumatic stress syndrome. Even I suffer from it, from the fact that I had to work for 20 years, do you know what I mean, or whatever it was. Do you know what I mean? But my suffering is so tiny that I don't notice it. Do you know what I mean? And everybody sits somewhere on that scale and everybody's experience of life puts them somewhere on that scale. And I think the, the aim of life ought to be to keep as low as possible on that scale and do everything in, in your life so as to keep that low, but at the same time, enjoy life. You know, make the most of it. There's the Northern Lights in Hastings. Back home. Yeah, back home. And... Uh, Time to come, come in the door. And have some plonk. And have, some, have a glass of vino. Or two. And uh, check the barometer. <laughs> <laughs> there are some short stories of Hesse's which I would like to have read when I was sort of 12, 13 sort of age. Which I would have gained enormously from. But, but, the, but the book I think I would have gained from was, would be Kafka's America. And, and that is because of the way, although it's an unfinished novel, it, um, uh, it's an adventure, uh, and it's a very kind of surreal one, which is, is kind of gripping and, and unreal. And it, um, but it ends up in, a, in a, an amazing um, metaphor for life in general and the world in general, in, in this incredible... Um, nature theatre of Oklahoma um, because it, you know he's travelling in America and uh, and it's kind of like a um, a metaphor for life in general really and he shows you the the good and the bad and you and it, and it but it leaves loads of space between the lines so that you can you can imagine the good and the bad if if they're not too pejorative terms. 
crime and punishment and stuff like that. They're works of genius and they're brilliant to read, but they don't really teach you anything profoundly new, you know. Uh, although they're masterpieces, you know, it's like like work of art, a brilliant work of art. Whereas Kafka's America is no, in no way a work of art, but it's, uh, but it is. A, I don't know. It uh, it's it, it kind of addresses the subconscious somehow. It's quite interesting. Um, I don't I don't know about Vega I mean, It's so dated. Is that is a masterpiece in its own right, and yet I think a more a, a more brilliant work than that, really, is a much shorter one, which is Wallace Shawn's The Fever, which is, it was read on the radio by Wallace Shawn brilliantly, and it takes about, I think it was about two hours or two and a half hour monologue of him just reading this, this monologue, and it is a masterpiece, that is brilliant, and that really sort of opens up the truth, the political truth of the world in a nutshell, like the Raggedy Joseph philanthropists did for you know for Hastings and and Britain a hundred years ago, but but this the fever by by um, by Wallace Shawn, whose father was a big was William Shawn, who was a big shot in the New Yorker for years, is is a real masterpiece. Um, you know, I was very impressed. I've listened to it several times, and it, you know, and, and I and I could listen to it again. Quite, and I wouldn't be bored. I'd find more in it. Uh, I think that's a, a brilliant piece of work for you know for political wisdom, um, and to be topical as well. Really, as topical now as ever. Really, more now than ever before. And that that was probably written around 1990, 1995, something like that. I think. I think Carl Sagan's books are masterpieces as well. Um, the Demon Haunted World and Billions and Billions, but especially The Demon Haunted World, I think I thought that was a very good book. Um, I'd recommend that to anyone young as well. But it depends on what someone's interested in. I've just been reading, I'm about halfway through a book by William Goldman, who was a, a film director, directed loads of famous films. And if someone's interested in entering the film industry, then that is a, a, a absolutely brilliant book. But if you're not interested in the film industry, then I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, except just as a kind of a pleasant book to read. But um, it, so it depends what 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 you're interested in, really. Well, I suppose Henry Miller comes quite high in that in that kind of category, although it's full of other stuff as well, and the Zen kind of aspects. Um, are intermittent in his work. Uh, Alan Watts, I think, would shine out in the Zen category. And some of his work is incredibly articulate and easy to read and understand. And, and he seemed, he was, he's one of the few people that I think I'd like to have met. And I think I'd have got on really well with him. I think he had a great sense of humour. Uh, a, a really interesting, nice bloke. And I'd recommend anything written by Alan Watts, to be quite honest. I've, I, everything I've read by him has been gripping and intriguing, interesting and uh, very informative, you know, very wise, good good stuff, or, or even funny at times. I think if I was going to watch any playwright and study any playwright, I think I'd sooner study him than anybody else, because he had such important things to say, even, even more so than people like Pinter. Pinter was entertaining, but I think Pirandello was getting right at the core of what it is to be a human being somehow. And I think his insights were completely separate from his political outlook, which were kind of expedient at the time, I suppose. He just thought people, you know, he thought a government should be strong and powerful and, and people who are feeble and hopeless should be should be controlled strictly, you know, and told what to do, you know, and so he was like a strict, strict school teacher in a way, I suppose, but he was also a genius, I think, the way he could understand human, the human mind, and uh, and and portray it so brilliantly in his plays, because there's nothing tacky in his work. I mean, if someone like me tried to do something like that, it'd just be so cheesy. You know, I just wouldn't be able to do it, but he does it brilliantly. 
um, and, it, and it just comes home with such power his, his kind of messages about how we really are and we don't think about it every day you know it's just like we go about our normal everyday lives we don't think about the fact that we're living on a little grain of sand in an infinite universe nobody thinks about the reality of our situation or predicament uh, and that's what Pirandello did in, in his particular way not from the, the, uh, the cosmological angle but from the well, cosmological f in the uh, metaphorical sense that, that we're all kind of prisoners of our own consciousness, I suppose.